9, we've learned some very important definitions um, in regards to confidence intervals, and it can get a little confusing about what to use when. So we want to take a couple pages here and just kind of regroup and make sure that we understand all the formulas and definitions we've seen in Chapter 9 before we move on to Chapters 10 and 11. Okay, Chapter 9 is all about single population confidence intervals and the sample size associated with those confidence intervals, as opposed to double population confidence intervals, which we'll, we'll be dealing with in Chapter 11. We've had two main sections, section 9.1 and 9.2. So if you look at your appendix on the notes pages, both of these are discussed on page 327 of the notes. The top box, or the top portion of the top box, is the confidence of proportion, and the second box, or second portion of that top box, is about the confidence interval for a mean. So I just typed that up there. So 9.1 is going to be page 327, the top half of that top box. And the 9.2 is the page 327 again, but the bottom half of the top box. And the confidence interval formulas in those boxes are um, given right here. P hat plus or minus Z alpha over 2, big huge square root, P hat times 1 minus P hat over N, which is the standard error of the sample proportions. And then over here, x bar plus or minus t alpha over 2 s over the square root of n, which is the standard error of the sample means. Now, what are these formulas for? Well, this formula uses st the statistic p hat, which is the sample proportion, to estimate where they think the parameter is, right? So this is a point estimate. It's a single value. So it's your best guess for where you think the population proportion is located population proportion being P. So this is a statistic, something you actually can get from a sample. The parameter is the unknown thing that you're trying to estimate about the population. So you use your sample data to make a guess about where you think the population data is going to be, or the population value is going to be. So the statistic P hat is a gauge, is a point estimate, single value estimate for where P is. Similarly, X bar is a sample mean, and your sample mean is your point estimate for your guess for where the population mean is going to be. So that's what a parameter is. The parameter is an unknown quantity or an unknown value, a measure of the population. But we don't know what it really is, so we use a sample value, a statistic, X bar or P hat, to gauge where those values mu or P might fall. So X bar is our estimate for mu, and P hat is our estimate for P. But of course we know that a point estimate is not really very useful because that's just a single value. And we know it's not really going to be that single value. We think it's going to be, you know, around that value. And that's why the formulas both have that plus or minus the margin of error, right? So this back end part here that you see is the margin of error for that confidence interval. And same thing with this confidence interval here. That t hat or t alpha over 2 s over the square root of n, that's your error. It's x bar plus or minus your error. And just to remind you, I'm going to put that in there. So the margin of error is what that z big square root portion, that whole thing is your margin of error for a proportion. On the t alpha over 2 s over the square root of n, that whole thing is your margin of error for a sample mean one. So the back end of those is the error. It's the window that you're building from your point estimate. Your point estimate goes in the center of your interval, and then you build your window based off of your margin of error and has different formulas for the different um, types of confidence intervals you're making. Now one of the big questions I have is how do I know this is what's being asked for? And that's a little bit hard to gauge, but what you want to do is you want to read through the problem and, say, and figure out are they asking me to construct an interval? And if so, what kind of interval are they asking me to make? So you use these formula if it, or these formulas if it's asking you to construct a confidence interval. So I have, to be, I have to be a little fuzzy about this, but in general, for proportion ones, what you're going to see is the words construct a confidence interval, make a confidence interval, and you're going to see proportions mentioned. They'll talk about X and N. They won't say the words X and N, but they kind of imply it. They might actually just directly say, construct a confidence interval for a proportion. Or they might say, construct a confidence interval, and percents and proportions are mentioned earlier in the problem. For the means and averages one, it's going to say construct a confidence interval and it'll talk about means and standard deviations 
roaming around because if they're going to have you construct this, you're going to need to know what S is. Or they'll give you a data set. Right? If they give you a data set, it has to be the one for means and averages. If they give you X and N somewhere floating around, then that's going to be the one for proportions. I just added that in a little bit. So X and N or percents are given somewhere, or proportions given somewhere. That'll be a proportion one. And then if you see the mean and standard deviation or the data set is given somewhere, then that would be a mean one, one for the averages. Now, what are the requirements we have to check? Well, it's complicated. We always need random, uh, a random sample. Um, we need an independent sample. Now remember that um, we can fake independence, more or less, with little n, our sample size, being less than or equal to 0.05 of our capital N, which is our population size. And sometimes you have to kind of talk about that. Well, of course, my sample is less than 5% of blah, 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 right? And sometimes you don't. If it's something that is not with or is with replacement, then you don't have to worry about this. This is only a problem if you're doing this without replacement. Just keep that in mind. And then you have to check normality. So for proportions, you have to check the n times p hat times 1 minus p hat is greater than or equal to 10. But for means, you either are given somehow that the population is normal, or given a graph, like a normal probability plot, or you have to learn it from n, or have to discern it from the rule of thumb that n is greater than or equal to 30. And again, that's just a rule of thumb. It's not actually perfect in every situation, but for our purposes, it's close enough. Now the calculator entry is given to you right on page 327. Let me pull that up. And you can see right here on the box, I have the little gray highlight right there for what the calculator entry is. So for a single proportion, it's one prop z int. And then for the single mean, it's t interval. And again, notice I'm using the word single because there's more coming, oh yes, in chapter 11. But for right now, it's just one prop z int and t interval. Those are the two calculator entries. And they tell you which distribution they're using right there in the problem. And, and in the, um, it's in the formula because you see the z alpha over 2. That's your probability usage for creating that margin of error. And it's also right there in the calculator entry. It's telling you z int. It's using the z distribution. This is using the student's T distribution, thought of by the guy that used to work at the Guinness Brewery, right? All right, so that's our distributions. So that's pretty easy. Then the only question becomes, what are the critical values and how do we find them? Well, the critical values for a confidence interval are pretty straightforward because they're always plus or minus alpha, z alpha over 2 or t alpha over 2. So for the z ones, it's plus or minus z alpha over 2. For the t ones, it's plus or minus t alpha over 2. It's that bit that you're multiplying by the standard error in order to create your margin of error. Now where do you get these things from? Well, the z alpha over 2s, there's two ways you can get them. You can either get them from inverse norm using the left tail area. Remember, it always has to be the left tail area or the bottom row of the t table actually has some pretty common ones, the most common ones you're going to use. So either you use inverse norm, which is in your calculator under your distribution menu, so second distribution number three, inverse norm. So either using that, right, and if you have the most advanced calculator, you actually don't need the left tail area anymore. You actually can use center area or right area if you're using the newest um, system for the calculator. But if you're on the old system, it has to be a left tail area. The other option is the bottom row of the T table, which is on the first page of, well, not the first page, but on the T table on page 326 of your appendix. That might get altered in different semesters, so just pay attention to what semester you're watching this in, and you might need to change the page number. But for right now, it's on page 326, right there. So that bottom row has about 12 of the most commonly used C alpha over 2s. Now T alpha over 2, you have two options. You can either use inverse T or you can use the t table. Just never forget for either one of those that your degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. You need that in order to be able to find it either with the table 
or with the calculator. So in the table, there are all these different degrees of freedoms over here on the left. But of course, there's infinitely many degrees of freedom, so it gets a little confusing, and the calculator, I mean the table, just starts skipping them. So if you're stuck with a degrees of freedom of 62, you can either use 60, which is the closest one you can get, or you could use the more advanced system of the calculator. So let me quit and get out of this. I'd go to distribution. I'd pick number 4, inverse T. Now inverse T does have to still be left tail area, um, just, just the way it works. So you could type in 0.01 and say my degrees of freedom is, I don't know, 10. And then I would go down to paste and press enter. And that's how I would get a T alpha over 2. It had come out of the calculator and it should match whatever comes out of the table. And you can see that it does. Here's 0.01 right here, and there's degrees of freedom, 10. So 2.764. Of course, the calculator is doing left tail area, and the table is doing right tail area. That's one downside to this. So just keep in mind that the calculator said it's 0.01 in the area on the left, so it's a very small value on the left, so it's a left tail value. And the table does the area on the right. You just have to know to use plus or minus in Chapter 9. All right, let's go back to the notes. There they are. So now we're done with that table. So just to reiterate, the most important part for you is not going to be um, knowing, or excuse me, it's not going to be the formulas because the formulas are right on the formula sheet. It's going to be knowing which formula to use when. Right? And that's really tricky. There's no good way to say it. Um, you just have to kind of read in the problem and look for particular things. All right, now what about sample size formulas? There were three of them. And these are on page 327 as well. And again, if you're watching in a later semester, that might change. But for right now, it's page 327. If you're in a different semester and the page numbers have changed, just put in whatever page number is appropriate for you. So these are all on page 327 on the bottom box, right here, at least for us. So now, how do you know which one's which? Well, the first two in particular are really tricky because they're both from 9.1. They're going to ask you how many, how big a sample, that kind of thing. So how large a sample. And percents and proportions are going to be mentioned. But the difference is that the one on the left is going to have some old proportion mentioned. So it's going to mention proportions and percentages, and it's going to have some old study. You know, back in 2000, we did this, and this was our percentage, that kind of thing. Whereas this other one is not going to have an old percentage given. So it's not going to have any prior data. So the old prior data is going to be your p hat for this first formula. But in the second formula, you don't have an old prior p hat, so there's nothing to use. All right, so then the 9-2 formula doesn't talk about proportions at all. It talks about how large a sample, how big a sample, but it mentions means and standard deviations. If you see means and standard deviations flowing in a how many question, that is definitely this formula right here. And of course, they're asking you how large a sample is needed to estimate, to estimate um, the proportion. Right? That's what I mean when I say proportions are flying all over the place in the problem. Or to estimate the proportion, to estimate the proportion, and to estimate the mean. So if you see proportions flying around, that or percents, that is a red flag right here, that it is one of these two formulas. And then you got to be really careful and see if you have an old percentage given before, because that's p hat. If you don't have an old p hat, then that's the second formula. If you do have an old p hat, that's the first formula. And then, like I said before, um, for the third one, the third one's kind of obvious because it'll talk about estimating the mean. And you'll also see standard deviation kind of roaming around the problem. So if you see standard deviation anywhere, then that's definitely this third one. Now, I just wanted to make a couple notes about the errors. The first two they have to have errors be in decimal form. The third one does not. And I typed up a little example there for you. So if it must be in decimal form, if they say a margin of error of 4%, then you use 0.04.
If they say a marginal error of 6%, then you use 0 0.06, right? So for these first two, because they're dealing with proportions, everything has to be decimals, everything. But for means and standard deviations, that is not the case. You can have error be, you know, 52, 874, you know, you don't know, because means can be very, very large. Proportions are limited between 0 and 1, but the means are not. And the critical values are pretty easy to spot. They're the z alpha over 2. And it doesn't really matter about the plus or minus thing because you're squaring it in each one of these formulas. So you can see how z alpha over 2 gets squared, which turns it positive even if it was negative. So it literally does not matter which one you use. Now, the, the last bit before the end is how are you going to be able to tell a sample size from a confidence interval? So let me give you a couple warnings here. All right, it's a little bit tricky, but for confidence interval um, ones, those are usually easier to spot because you're going to look for the words that just say construct a confidence interval for. Look for just the words construct a confidence interval, but don't have anything extra added on to it. Construct a confidence interval for the proportion. Construct a confidence interval for the mean. That's what you're going to see. I don't know why I'm giving it a... Um, weird voice, but I'm trying, right? So mean proportion, that's it. Sample size is a little bit trickier, right? So what you're going to look for is how many people do we need to construct a confidence interval? How large a sample is required to construct a confidence interval, right? So when you see those words, you know, how large a sample, how many people, look for the question words. Those are the ones that spot that this is a sample size question. One less caveat and something to be warned about. Students often confuse the confidence level with the proportions in the proportion problems. So just be extra careful. Confidence level is not the p hat from this formula, and nor is it the p hat from this formula in the center, the point estimate. It is not. Confidence in or the confidence level, the C level, like 95% or whatever, is just how you find your Z alpha over 2. That's it. So do not make it the center of your interval. Do not make it the p hat in your sample size formula, period, the end. C level is always your z alpha over 2, or how you find your z alpha over 2, and that's it.